Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metcalf Institute's 23rd Annual Public Lecture Series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We do this through a variety of approaches. We offer science training for professional journalists, such as the annual science immersion workshop for journalists that is happening right now. We offer communication for communication training rather for scientists from all over the country. And we also organize the inclusive SciComm symposium, which brings people together from across the country to share practices and research that make science communication inclusive, equitable, and intersectional. We also offer a great number of public events like this one. This is a very different year for us though, as it is for everyone. Because of the, the coronavirus pandemic, we moved our annual science immersion workshop to, and our annual public lecture series both online. While this required many shifts in our delivery, it offered the opportunity to pivot in some very important ways. Originally, we'd planned for this year's lecture series to explore the practical implications of climate change. Specifically, we wanted to feature speakers who could discuss the ways we are already witnessing climate change and what we could expect to see with a global average temperature increase of two degrees C, which is the global limit that the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 was designed to achieve. While that topic by itself is a significant one, we all know that the novel coronavirus came into the equation earlier this year. As it became clear that COVID-19 would have significant effects on every aspect of our lives for the foreseeable future, we decided to expand the lecture series to look at how the pandemic might affect our responses to climate change. Then over the last few weeks, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Rhea Milton, Dominique Fells and Rayshard Brooks, among countless other Black Americans before them, have forced a national reckoning with anti-Black violence and the many ways that racism is structurally embedded in our society. This conversation is painful, difficult, and essential. So we decided to pivot our annual lecture series again to address the intersections of these three critical issues, climate change, COVID-19, and systemic racism. These three issues are very closely tied together. Climate change is often described as the great equalizer, but that's not accurate. It's more accurately described as the great magnifier because it magnifies existing inequities. We've seen the same problems with COVID-19, which has disproportionately affected people of color in the United States. We acknowledge that we can only begin to scratch the surface of these intertwined challenges in a one week webinar series. However, we hope that these discussions will provide all of you with new insights, food for thought, and most importantly, ideas for action. With that introduction, I'm thrilled to introduce today's lecture and speaker. Today is June 17th, which means we're at the very beginning of the Atlantic hurricane season. In spite of the early stage of the season, we've already had three named tropical storms. But hurricanes aren't the only risks related to climate change. There is inland flooding, wildfire, drought, and the host of cascading effects that arise from any sort of emergency situation. This is a complicated mix of challenges to address even under the best circumstances. It is exponentially more difficult in the middle of a pandemic. Today's speaker, Dr. Samantha Montano, specializes in analyzing these complications in a field she calls disasterology. Dr. Montano is an assistant professor of emergency management and homeland security at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. She holds a PhD in emergency management from North Dakota State University. She first became involved in emergency management in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina and the levee failure, as well as the BP oil disaster. Dr. Montano's research explores the role of nonprofit organizations, grassroots efforts, and volunteerism in disaster. She speaks regularly on various emergency management issues, including emergency management policy and climate change. She also has a book forthcoming about disasters and climate change that will be published by Park Row Books next summer. Lucky for us, we can get some early insights on all of these, these ideas today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Montano. Great. 
Thank you so much for having me. Um, can you see the screen okay? The PowerPoint? Not yet. Mm, okay. There it is. Good. All right. Awesome. Um, so thank you for um, coming today. I'm excited to talk with all of you um, about uh, the <laughs> intersection of disaster response and uh, emergency management and how this all relates to the pandemic and the climate crisis. So I want to start by laying the groundwork uh, for the rest of my talk with this graphic. You may have seen this around the internet before. Obviously it's a bit of a joke, but it makes this important commentary that there is no part of the country that is untouched by disaster. At the same time, it's important to understand that while everywhere faces some kind of risk, the extent of that risk and the ability of a community or an individual to address that risk varies significantly. Uh, given what we know about the climate crisis and the uh, future of our risk, uh, we know that there is uh, already and will continue to be more need across the country uh, and many of much of that need manifests in the form of disasters and requires uh, a response from uh, our emergency management system uh, in order to keep pace with uh, that changing risk. So I want to split today's talk into three different parts. There's a lot to cover here. Um, my strategy is to begin by giving you a brief introduction to emergency management. I find that many people are pretty unfamiliar with the profession and the discipline. Um, in the process of talking about that, I also want to give you a framework for thinking about disasters that hopefully you can carry into your own work. Uh, I, in part two, will go into uh, the pandemic as an event that has challenged the emergency management system and also complicated our response to other disasters. And then I'll end by talking about how uh, the emergency management system is built or not built to manage the effects of the climate crisis. And I think we'll be able to pause for questions in between each part. So uh, the approach that we take to managing disasters in the US is referred to as emergency management. I like to think of this as a system that is operating constantly all around us and uh, in which all of us are a part. Emergency management is a discipline of study and also a profession. We are concerned with this model here, uh, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery from natural and man-made hazard events. Uh, you'll see in a minute that this encompasses a lot of tasks and activities and is uh, continuous. Um, this is the model that we use in emergency management really as an organizing tool to help us kind of sort through all the different tasks that are done. It's important to note here that uh, this disaster life cycle is a continuous process. There's not really one beginning or end uh, and that um, that uh, you know, generally we're talking about preparedness coming first, that's leading into a response when a disaster happens, then you're going into recovery, rebuilding the community and mitigation here, meaning anything you're doing to try to prevent that disaster from happening. So we'll talk through this a bit. Um, we don't have time to go into the exact definitions of each of these phases, but I've listed here kind of the key tasks that each one encompasses. Um, I think it's important to spend some time talking through this because um, you'll see how this, uh, each of these tasks are complicated uh, by the pandemic, complicated 
uh, in the context of the climate crisis. So to start with, we have response. This is probably what you're most familiar with. Um, it's generally what people think of when they think of emergency management. This is when we're sending out warnings, uh, doing evacuations, opening shelters, leading search and rescue, providing medical assistance, doing family reunifications. Uh, this is, you know, generally what the media is covering. And so we have a, a pretty general sense of all that is going on here. As the response ends, we move into recovery, which involves everything from clearing debris away, doing damage assessments, rebuilding homes, getting the economy going again, addressing mental health issues that have arisen because of the disaster. Folks tend to have much less of a sense of what goes on during recovery. It gets a lot less media coverage. The kind of big Hollywood disaster movies end before the characters get into rebuilding. So unless you have kind of been through the process yourself, you probably don't know much about recovery. Uh, recovery from major disasters takes a lot longer than you probably think. Uh, it's multiple years, if not decades, to rebuild a community. It's important to note also, though, that recovery is not guaranteed. There are people and communities that don't recover from disasters. Um, there are, you know, these multiple dimensions of recovery. So maybe somebody is able to rebuild their house, but they're still struggling with mental health issues. Uh, recovery is not a linear process. There's a lot of ups and downs as people try to find the resources to be able to recover. We also see in recovery a particular manifestation of the way in which disasters compound inequality. Recovery really illuminates the overlapping injustices that uh, poor communities especially experience in the wake of disaster. Then we have preparedness, which is encompassing anything that we're doing to ready ourselves to respond and recover from disasters. So planning and stockpiling supplies are kind of the more traditional idea of disaster preparedness, but uh, there's actually a lot more going on here than just that. Uh, preparedness is happening at multiple levels, individual, organizational, and governmental. We also uh, include here all the things that we're doing to actually build emergency management infrastructure. So creating emergency management agencies, uh, staffing and actually funding those agencies, uh, do, having them actually do the trainings and exercises in preparation for response. Uh, this would also include policy creation related to all phases. Uh, and then it's also not only the actions that uh, you take or an organization or a government agency takes, preparedness also incorporates all of the characteristics of our community that uh, may have an impact on our ability to respond and recover. So there's some really good research here about the importance of really strong social networks in communities and how that can contribute to more effective response and recovery. Um, obviously, um, you know, the uh, economic health of a community is really vital here if you're a community that uh, doesn't have a lot of money, doing preparedness efforts um, is going to be more difficult uh, for you to accomplish. Uh, this is mirrored kind of at the individual level. If you are a family of six living paycheck to paycheck, you probably don't really have the money to be stockpiling supplies. Um, and so we see all kinds of disparities in how communities are able to go about actually undertaking these preparedness activities. And then finally, we have mitigation. Uh, like preparedness, uh, mitigation is happening at the individual level, community-wide level. It can be everything from building levees, flood infrastructure, uh, to uh, individual, more individual actions like raising homes up. Uh, when you hear politicians say that our solution to climate change is managed retreat as sea levels rise, they're really talking about buyout programs, which is something that emergency management has been doing for many decades already all across the country. 
Uh, and ultimately, mitigation is a uh, really complicated process that requires an incredible amount of community engagement and buy-in in order uh, for it to actually be done justly and effectively. Uh, it's also shockingly expensive and takes a shockingly long time to actually do. So, as you can see, emergency management is encompassing a lot of different activities, right? Building a levy looks a lot different than doing search and rescue, which looks a lot different than mental health recovery. And so because of that diversity of tasks, it is, uh, requires a lot of people to be involved. Um, so the short answer here is that everyone is involved in emergency management. Um, but I'll break this down a little bit more for you. Um, generally, we break the stakeholders up uh, into these different categories, uh, starting with government, which is probably the group you're most uh, familiar with when it comes to emergency management. All levels of government are involved in various ways. Um, to pull this apart a little bit more at the federal level, we have the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, but we also have HHS, um, DHS, HUD, EPA, CDC, DOE, all of those other federal agencies also have a role to play. Um, also, Congress is involved. They are controlling the purse strings for emergency management. And then uh, the White House is also directly involved in management as well. Uh, that's mirrored at the state and local level with governors and mayors being involved, city councils uh, being involved, uh, your local and state level emergency management agencies and kind of all of those other federal agency counterparts at those levels. We also have uh, businesses that are involved um, and actually increasing involvement from the business sector. Everything from corporate involvement to a small local restaurant who's cooking for people staying at a shelter. You have businesses that are contracted to do disaster relief work. You have companies that are volunteering and are volunteering their staff, donating their time. Uh, and then, of course, businesses can sometimes be the cause of disaster. So the BP is an example in the Gulf uh, Coast oil spill, also PG&E recently with the campfire. So they can be involved in a number of different ways. We also have the nonprofit sector that is involved. These groups can uh, be ones that have disaster specific missions, but also ones that expand uh, their work during times of crisis. You have international groups like Oxfam International or Doctors Without Borders. You also have national level disaster organizations, Red Cross, Salvation Army, Rebuilding Together, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, then you have local organizations that are involved. And right now, the food banks, the local food banks across the country are really kind of keeping us afloat right now. Uh, we also see that there is a lot of grassroots organizing, grassroots advocacy work that's going on at a more local level usually. We also see that during the response, new groups may spontaneously form uh, to address various needs that are going unmet. And then we also see that mutual aid networks emerge within uh, communities to address various needs in kind of a more informal way. Then we have the media. I know media doesn't always like to think of themselves as a stakeholder in emergency management, but arguably they're one of our most important. Uh, when a disaster happens, people are turning to media to uh, hear about what is happening and uh, get instructions for evacuation, finding out where shelters are open, um, and are essentially told you know, how to respond to the event via media communication. Um, but it's not only in response. We see that there is a correlation between the amount of donations that come into a community, the number of volunteers that are going to help a community, 
based on the extent of national media coverage. Uh, we also know that when it comes to mitigation and preparedness, that media can be the avenue with which a community learns about a risk that they face. In fact, it's quite unusual for a community to successfully undertake mitigation efforts without um, so real uh, education and support coming from local media in particular. Then we have scientists. So um, you heard Sunshine mention at the beginning that uh, uh, the word disasterology, I use that term to incorporate anyone who studies disasters. Really, uh, there are a number of different disciplines that are involved in this work, everything from uh, economists, historians, psychologists, sociologists, all different disciplines are bringing their own perspectives to this work. Um, I'm personally situated within uh, the discipline of emergency management, um, but definitely are drawing from these other disciplines. We also have our hazard scientists, uh, seismologists, volcanologists, hydrologists, uh, folks who are studying climate, all of uh, them are providing really important information that is um, the groundwork for the work that we do in emergency management. We also have individuals and households. So when I said earlier that everyone is involved in emergency management, um, it's not just how you might be involved depending on what your job is or kind of where you fit in one of these existing groups, but also that you're just involved as you as an individual. Um, I, uh, since the pandemic began, I've been using the example of wearing a mask when you go out in public. We know that one of the factors that will determine the outcome for the pandemic is whether or not people choose to actually wear masks when they leave their house. So, um, you know, this is largely an individual decision that if we all make, uh, that can, you know, change the tide of the pandemic. Obviously, there are other issues like contact tracing and vaccines that are uh, more than just an individual effort. Uh, but still, we can have an influence over, over how this unfolds. And then finally, we have uh, arguably our most important stakeholder group, which are the disaster survivors themselves. So these are the people who are in the communities that experience disasters and whose lives are most directly affected by the decisions that are made uh, by all of these other groups. And so as I went through that quickly, um, you can probably guess that uh, there are major differences in perspectives, motivations, resources, interests among these different groups. Uh, ideally, we would see that all these stakeholder groups are working really collaboratively, that they're all coordinating and communicating with one another, not only during response, but in all phases, and that they were all working towards some common goal. But of course, that does not always happen. Um, and so uh, a fair amount of kind of the conflict or ineffectiveness in emergency management kind of comes back to this uh, stakeholder diversity. So um, I, there's a lot of different ways that we can kind of pull apart this system to gain a better understanding of how this all works together. I think the simplest way to think about this is the formal side of the, uh, the, formal side of the system and the informal side of the system. So in the formal, you have those government agencies, you have first responders, you have nonprofits with disaster missions, uh, businesses with government contracts who know that they are a part of the emergency management system that have done some kind of training that are intentionally deployed to a community that are aware and a part of plans and procedures that are coordinating and communicating with one another uh, throughout their efforts. And then on the other side, you have survivors, you have the local nonprofits that find themselves involved in addressing the crisis in some way. You have these emergent groups that I mentioned. These are the people who are there first in a community when a disaster happens. There's this myth that disaster survivors are just like sitting around waiting for help to arrive uh, from this formal system. And that's not at all the case. They immediately spring to action. They're the ones who initiate search and rescue. Um, they're very much involved in the, in the response and you know they're the last ones there for recovery. Um, 
but uh, the folks in this informal part are often not trained. They are self-deploying. They're kind of unaware of existing plans and procedures. They're not really operating within this emergency management framework that has been created. Uh, so there tends to be a lot of tension and conflict among these two parts of the system. Uh, and you can kind of, uh, particularly in larger scale disasters, uh, cat in catastrophes, you can see the, um, the strain that comes about between these two sides. So um, there's a, a lot of problems with our emergency management system. I kind of put up the top four here uh, that we want to kind of keep in mind and that will kind of pull apart a bit more as we move forward. Um, but the first thing to know is, you know, there's very often a lot of critique of government uh, and failures of government response. Um, it's important to keep in mind that this system was intentionally designed for there to be limited government intervention. Sometimes it is the case that government response is not doing what they've said they were going to do, but more often than not, it's the case that the government isn't intending to do what the public thinks that the government is intending to do. Um, we also see that uh, we have had a tendency to prioritize individual efforts over community-wide efforts, which is really, uh, you know, kind of following in line with this pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality that is really antithetical to the way in which uh, the research tells us communities respond uh, to disasters as more of a collective. Uh, we also see that uh, the emergency management system rarely accounts for disproportionate impacts uh, experienced across different communities. Uh, and then as a result of kind of all of these issues, we end up uh, at this one place, which kind of drives everything else here. And that is that many needs are going unmet across the country, not only in response, uh, but also in recovery with the length of time it takes for a community to go through recovery, the how difficult that process is. Um, but then also ahead of time, we're very reactive in the way that we approach managing disasters. We're doing very little mitigation and preparedness. So those needs are also going unmet. So I think maybe I'll pause here for a second and answer some questions. if there are any. So I'm just taking a look at these right now. Okay. Um, and I, I think that you're about to get into a couple of these, but um, one of them says, are, uh, Maria asks, are there any lessons that we can learn from emergency management during this acute COVID-19 crisis that can be applied to better managing the more chronic climate, climate crisis? Yes, and I'm about to get to that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Okay, another question here uh, from Afonso is both the climate change crisis and COVID-19 share the undeniable characteristic of disproportionately harming developing countries and poor communities the most. During disasters, it's also true that poor communities and communities of color struggle to respond and recover, as you've pointed out. What are the international formal initiatives to transfer emer emergency management resources and expertise from developed to developing countries? Does the U.S. play an important role in such initiatives? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there are. So some of those international nonprofits um, through like OSHA and the UN, uh, there are definitely like a international level expertise where uh, emergency management and uh, internationally it's more called disaster risk reduction where those uh, best practices and research are shared. Um, I will say though that there isn't as much of that as you might expect or want there to be, um, but there, there are efforts to do that and certainly moving forward, um, particularly in thinking about climate adaptation, which very much overlaps with what we call disaster mitigation. Um, I think we're kind of starting to see a bit more of that as well. Okay, so we'll move on to part two. Uh, taking a look at COVID as an event that challenges uh, our emergency management system. Hopefully this will kind of help illuminate 
some of what I was just talking about. So uh, usually when we think of emergency management and disasters, we're thinking more about those natural hazards like hurricanes and earthquakes, but emergency management actually takes an all hazards approach which means that we cover everything from school shootings and other kinds of terrorism, oil spill, train derailments, nuclear meltdowns, and even pandemics, as it turns out. Uh, so obviously, it has long been known that a pandemic like the one we're experiencing now was possible. Uh, FEMA has included a pandemic scenario exactly like the one we're experiencing in their national risk assessment. Uh, so in this sense, you know, this was not a surprise. Uh, and because uh, there has been such an awareness of this possibility and this risk, there were a number of planning initiatives across the federal government and at state and local levels to prepare for a pandemic. Uh, primarily though, those planning efforts were done within public health agencies uh, at the federal level done with HHS. Um, and then kind of secondarily included emergency management agencies. So I, I made a quick graphic here to just kind of demonstrate this. You have the kind of world of public health and you have the world of emergency management and there has traditionally been a, a bit of an overlap, but they have remained relatively siloed from one another. Um, emerged <clears throat> Sorry, emergency management as it exists today did not exist during the 1918 pandemic. There has been a handful of other kind of public health related issues in the US in the past 70 years, but largely public health took the lead on that and emergency management served as a supporting agency. Um, so they're going into this pandemic, there was a, a bit of a lack of clarity about what exactly the role of emergency management was in responding to the pandemic. Um, and then uh, kind of we've kind of learned a lot about what the role is as the pandemic uh, has unfolded. Um, I will just kind of caution everybody right now that we are still very much much in the midst of doing research to really understand uh, how emergency management has uh, been involved in the response to the pandemic. There are, for a number of reasons, kind of a lack of clarity right now. Um, so just kind of take this with a grain of salt, but. Um, what I can say right now is that um, is kind of what has happened at the federal level. Uh, there's some, some differences state and local levels. Um, we've seen that FEMA has moved from a supporting agency to uh, the coordinating agency of federal efforts in about March. Uh, we've seen that the Stafford Act, which is the cornerstone of emergency management policy was has been used to uh, provide declarations for all states and territories across the country, which um, signals that emergency management is very central to the response efforts. Uh, and then uh, a really important point uh, as we start talking about kind of the strain that the system is facing is that because of the pandemic for the first time ever all emergency management agencies across the country were activated simultaneously. Um, we that was completely unprecedented um, and uh, really uh, a, a little bit concerning because we saw uh, that the model that we've traditionally used of having agencies come in from other communities to support uh, the work in the community that's in the midst of a crisis didn't quite work anymore uh, as every community had to be focused on uh, their own efforts in, in their own communities. So uh, the pandemic has made clear, if it were not already, that disasters do not occur in isolation from one another. Um, the pandemic, uh, I'm gonna talk about how the pandemic complicated uh, preparedness and complicates response to other disasters that happen in a second. But I also wanna point out that the pandemic stopped on ongoing recovery efforts across the country all of the communities that have been affected by disasters in the past five, 10 years have had their recovery efforts in some way paused or otherwise changed because 
of the pandemic. Um, there's also been some reporting on how mitigation projects have paused. Um, and also there are significant concerns about the future of some mitigation projects because of budget changes at the state and local level. And so um, because everybody was responding at once to the pandemic and also because of all of these other efforts that were in progress, uh, and also the ongoing need to prepare for disasters, we have kind of arrived at this moment of seeing the emergency management system significantly strained. So I wanna just take a couple of minutes to talk through a couple of the disasters that have happened since the pandemic began. Um, the first one that I have here uh, were some tornadoes in Tennessee on March 3rd. They caused significant damage in multiple neighborhoods and killed 25 people. Uh, this was right before the stay at home orders were issued and uh, was kind of before the public was fully aware of how much the pandemic was going to affect the country. And so as a result, we saw a pretty traditional response to this event. There was kind of this convergence of help from surrounding communities. The Washington Post reported there were 20,000 volunteers who signed up for help. I know that sounds like a lot, but that's a, a typical number. Uh, at the same time, uh, there were some initial signs of how the pandemic was affecting this response. So the kind of first sign of trouble was that volunteers started reporting they were unable to buy masks and hand sanitizers at stores. You know, that sounds um, kind of not like too big of a deal in the midst of a tornado and a pandemic, but um, that was actually a kind of a first sign of how the resources that we need to respond to something like a tornado happen to overlap with some of the resources we need for the pandemic. We also saw that uh, those volunteer efforts that were so strong at first uh, really faded away much more quickly than usual as people were pulled back home because of stay at home orders. Although we did see some volunteers pretty quickly transition to help with the COVID response. A couple of weeks later, there was a tornado in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Um, it caused a significant amount of damage, but no deaths. And this was the first event that kind of fully occurred in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and it was kind of our first sense of how people would respond. Uh, what we saw is that, you know, search and rescue was done. People came to help. Um, this was right at the height of the PPE shortage. Uh, so there were not a lot of masks being worn. Um, and there was really relatively little media attention for this event um, and kind of faded away quickly. We did see some initial um, issues in recovery. For example, insurance companies had closed their offices and so survivors um, kind of had extra hurdles in order uh, to jump over in order to be able to file claims. Then we had the tornado outbreak Easter weekend. Um, this uh, led to a lot of conversations about sheltering in particular. Um, I, and also we saw that decisions about sheltering in pandemics were going to be decided at a local level and look different from place to place. So there's an example here of a community that announced they would not be opening community shelters in the event of a tornado uh, because of the pandemic. Other communities did open shelters. There were reports that some people were turned away at shelters because they didn't have masks. Um, so raised a, a lot of important issues here. Um, and then we had the Midland flooding in Michigan, uh, which is the largest kind of traditional disaster since the pandemic began. Um, we, I think this, as we're thinking ahead to hurricane season and some of these much larger disasters, I think Midland gives us kind of our best sense of um, kind of how emergency management is going to approach things. Um, so we saw that uh, 10,000 people were under evacuation orders. 
Government officials encouraged evacuees to stay with friends and family in other parts of the state rather than trying to, uh, to in an attempt to limit the people staying at shelters. Uh, they screened individuals as they arrived, required masks. Uh, there was much more organization and coordination than there were for the tornadoes. Uh, we also saw that the governor of Michigan uh, said that um, said that emergency orders related to COVID were suspended if they impeded emergency flood efforts. So that reflected a sentiment sentiment among the emergency management community that kind of whatever the most imminent hazard is has to take precedent to, uh, has to take precedent, even if uh, that's kind of if those things are in conflict. Um, but still, we saw fairly limited volunteer efforts, and where there were volunteer efforts, it was highly localized. And then we have the protest against uh, police violence. I wanted to include these here. Um, they don't really fit into our traditional definition of disaster, um, and I wouldn't feel comfortable putting protests, especially peaceful protests, in that category. Um, and in fact, I think there's a greater argument to be made that poli police violence is the disaster in this case. Uh, but still, as you look at a situation like has unfolded specifically in Minneapolis or in New York, um, we do see that the emergency management system is involved in a number of ways. Um, you know, emergency operations centers, mutual aid agreements are being used in various communities in various ways in response to the protests. Um, and outside of government, I think that the protests uh, are pretty instructive for us in thinking about those more traditional disasters. Uh, so for example, everybody at these protests have been wearing masks, they're trying to keep their distance, they're very much demonstrating an awareness of the pandemic. Um, we've also seen extensive mutual aid networks emerge and operate within the protest environment to help get food and resources and extra masks to people who are participating. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it gives us this indication that, uh, you know, in times of crisis, even if there is a higher risk in this case because of the pandemic, we can still count on those volunteer and kind of more mutual aid, informal systems of aid to show up and help. So um, again, just to point out that these disasters have been relatively small in size, but um, are still pretty instructive for um, you know what we could see in a in a larger disaster. Um, you know, just as a refresher, you can go through this list of tasks of the phases and see how every single one of these is affected in some way by the pandemic. And of course, um, this pandemic is here to stay for quite a while. There will, for sure, be other disasters that happen. Um, and so um, we want to kind of keep in mind as these other disasters happen, uh, take note of how people are responding, kind of what best practices are and try to reintegrate that into preparedness efforts for future disasters. Stop there for a question. Okay, we have a couple of questions here that are um, well, one of them's especially timely. So Anne asks, I just read that five of the staffers at the operations base for Florida's Hurricane Hunter aircraft have tested positive for COVID-19 and now are on 14 day quarantine. What response and mitigation steps are followed for emergency managers, including those in data gathering roles or hurricane tracking roles, when emergency management personnel themselves are affected by COVID? Yeah, this has been a really big issue for emergency management since the pandemic began. Um, so uh, emergency managers during a response work in what we call emergency operations centers. It's, you know, huge room and you the <laughs> traditionally the idea is you get as many people into that room as you can representatives from various agencies and organizations that are involved in the response and you try to coordinate that response from that room together. Um, and of course, getting as many people into one room is exactly what we don't want to be doing right now. So um, many emergency management agencies and emergency operations centers uh, went to virtual. Um, so folks were working from home like everyone else uh, as much as possible and kind of having only, you know, a handful of people actually physically be in the EOCs. Um, 
we have seen a number of cases though across the country where people have tested positive or they thought that uh, people had COVID um, in emergency management agencies. Colorado, um, there was a they t ended up testing negative, but there was a concern that multiple people at the main state emergency operations center had COVID. Um, and so it is a very real concern. Um, and outside of doing virtual EOCs, there's not a lot that folks can do. Um, most emergency management agencies across the country are a one one person show. Um, they, uh, you know, we have a, even have a lot of part time and volunteer emergency managers across the country. So there really isn't that redundancy, which is exactly why there was such a concern Concern when every single emergency management agency had to activate at once because if an emergency manager in one town did get sick in a hurricane, usually you can fly someone in from across the country and it's not a big deal. Um, but in the situation of the pandemic, you know, you can't necessarily do that or count on that. Um, so it is a really big concern. It has been a concern this entire time and moving forward, especially, um, you know, virtual EOCs work really well when everybody has power and internet connections, uh, but in the middle of a hurricane, that's not a guarantee. And so there is a kind of a recognition that more traditional EOCs are going to have to act activate in those scenarios. Um, and again, not, not a lot of great answers there. It's kind of just focus on the most imminent need and um, do the best you can. Um, and that kind of leads into this other question as well. So Kate asks um, uh, to hear more about the military's role in responding to disasters um, and the role it's played, especially during the pandemic, if much at all. She notes that she's seen very little coverage of this aside from the use of the naval ship Mercy as an additional COVID-19 hospital. Yeah, so emergency management uh, and the military have kind of a complicated history. Um, traditionally, their role has been very minimal. There are a series of laws uh, that prevent or uh, inhibit their involvement. Um, that is part of this, um, but also um, there has been a movement away from using DOD resources um, to uh, address issues, you know, like the PPE shortage, right? Um, and having those uh, systems in place for uh, like stockpiling power um, moved under FEMA and DHS uh, historically, uh, as opposed to being under DOD. Um, it's kind of a, a point of conversation within emergency management that uh, doesn't really ever lead to too many good answers. Okay, so um, quickly, I want to go over climate change and how um, how this affects the emergency management systems. So uh, when we're thinking about the kind of future American hazard risk context, there are a couple of key factors that stand out. So we have climate change. As the climate is changing, there is an effect on the hazards that can cause disaster. I'll go into that in a minute. Um, something that's important to understand though is that it's not only climate change that is changing our risk. Uh, because clim climate change alone does not cause a disaster, right? It's one factor among many that can lead to disaster. Um, and uh, we need to consider all of those different factors if we want to come up with uh, solutions. So um, I tend to use Houston here as the example of a community that uh, kind of exemplifies all of these different factors that are contributing to this increasing risk. So in Houston, you know, you have uh, Houston and Southeast Texas more broadly, you have this sprawling city that has developed quickly and consistently into high risk floodplains while simultaneously paving over bayous and kind of the natural protections that have traditionally existed uh, against flooding. At the same time, you see this population growth and an underinvestment in flood infrastructure systems. And then you add climate change on top of that, which brings increased rainfall. And you end up with the situation that we see in Texas, where you have parts of the city, parts of Southeast Texas flooding multiple times a year. 
So um, this is just a quick uh, chart that I use when I teach my students about how climate change is related to emergency management. This is all based on the National Climate Assessment. Um, in emergency management, kind of the first thing that we do is uh, a risk assessment. So you assess the hazards that your community is at risk of experiencing. You think uh, through the characteristics of those hazards. You think about what vulnerabilities, what vulnerable groups that you have in your community. And you put this all together into a risk assessment. When we go look at the National Climate Assessment and what climate researchers tell us, we see that some of our kind of top natural hazards here that we're dealing with year round in the US, heat waves, rainstorms, hurricanes, wildfires, drought, all of these are affected not in just one way, but in multiple ways across the country. Uh, and what that indicates is that the risk assessments that we use in emergency management that have traditionally been based on more of a historical accounting of uh, disasters in that community are no longer adequate. Our risk assessments have to include climate change in them. Uh, and then also because we know these hazards are increasing and changing in all of these different ways, it indicates to us that our need is going to change in our communities and that the emergency management system needs to be, um, you know, uh, the capacity of that system needs to grow in order to actually meet all of these changing needs. Uh, the kind of big takeaway here and for this whole talk, hopefully, is that our current US emergency management system does not have the capacity to effectively manage the fallout of these climate related disasters. Um, we are already struggling to meet needs across the country. And in fact, we have been for a while. Uh, I first kind of heard about, uh, or first really saw the overarching capacity problems in this system in 2016 during the April tax day flood in Houston, Texas. I was there doing research in the middle of the flood at a number of the shelters that had been open in Houston. And uh, in that process, I ended up interviewing a number of volunteer coordinators and executive directors of our major national disaster nonprofits. And I was noticing some kind of weird trends with the volunteerism that was happening in Texas. And I was asking them about it and essentially said that they, or essentially they said there was volunteer fatigue across the country. There had been so many disasters in 2015 that were still in the process of going through recovery and already so many disasters in 2016, uh, a hurricane uh, Matthew on the East Coast, the 2016 Baton Rouge flooding, multiple floods in Texas, that those uh, disaster nonprofits nationally were strained and unable to go to every community that was in need of assistance. That continued obviously quite dramatically into 2017, where in the fall we had Harvey immediately followed by Irma and Maria uh, and the California wildfires. And uh, there we saw it wasn't only the disaster nonprofits that were under strain, but also FEMA and by default, the federal government. Uh, we There were a number of GAO reports that came out after that season talking about how FEMA had been understaffed, how they uh, didn't have the correct people uh, who had undergone training in the correct positions. Uh, and, you know, uh, we can connect that to some of the failures we saw, particularly in Puerto Rico, uh, following Maria. And then uh, there's been re relatively, there hasn't really been much of a slowdown since 2017 in terms of disasters. And of course, this is all exacerbated uh, this year by the pandemic. Uh, where you know we have the significant strain because of the pandemic, and then also uh, that you know has an effect on our ability to respond to these other events. And so, what we need to keep in mind as we move forward in this context of the climate crisis is that. Uh, we will need to respond to more events, probably bigger events. We will need to recover from more events. Uh, we need to be doing more mitigation. We need to be doing dramatically more preparedness. And as of right now, 
we're not really doing those things. Um, when we look at the history of how emergency management and particularly emergency management policy has developed in the US, we've seen that those key policy shifts have really come after major events. And so I would venture, I guess, that the pandemic uh, is one of those events uh, in emergency management, we call them focusing events. Certain disasters kind of capture the national narrative, capture political attention uh, in a way that allows us to push through emergency management policy change. Um, so imp it's important for us, even though we're very much still in the middle of the pandemic, to still kind of be looking forward to the future and thinking about what this emergency management policy change could look like. Um, we want to be thinking also about how we're incorporating emergency management into the broader climate narrative. Uh, and we want to be thinking about, you know, not just reforming the system, not just making small tweaks to emergency management policy, but thinking about the ways in which we can really transform our approach. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're very reactive. Uh, we kind of wait for the disaster to happen and then deal with it when it does. That is a really not good approach. We need to uh, be doing way more mitigation and preparedness, being more proactive, really trying to prevent these disasters from happening in the first place, figuring out ways to minimize those disasters that we can't prevent completely. Uh, and then also, um, perhaps most importantly, we need to be taking a needs-based approach. Um, it's not, you know, one uh, one system fits all here. Different communities have different needs. Different people have different needs. Um, we really need to be creating a system here that is centering social a social justice approach that is accounting for uh, where there are policy failures in other fields that uh, end up kind of manifesting during disasters and uh, figuring out how the emergency management system can address those needs rather than exacerbating them. So I think I'm out of time, so I will stop there. Um, but if there's maybe one more question. Wonderful, thank you so much, Samantha. Um, there are a couple questions here that I think we can get to quickly. Um, one of them is from Isaac who asks, what would be your advice uh, regarding what individuals could do to better prepare themselves for the hurricane season during the COVID crisis? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so as individuals, uh, you know, rethink your existing hurricane plans. If you live on the coast, you probably have kind of a general sense of what you do when a hurricane is coming. Really think that through. If you usually stay at a shelter, make sure that that shelter is still going to be open. Um, if you usually stay with family members, make sure that they aren't somebody who's in a high risk category and that they're still okay with you staying with them. Um, you know, make sure that um, if you were planning on staying at a hotel, check to make sure hotel rooms are available where you are um, and really just be extra kind of keyed into your local local news um, and local emergency management agencies uh, who hopefully will be explaining what is different this season than uh, in past seasons. Great, thank you. Um, and there's also, I'm, I think this is something you can probably answer quickly. Um, someone asks about the fact that the military has long used war game systems to simulate real or anticipated threats and develop coordinated and specific responses. Is there an equivalent modeling system for disaster that exists or is in development? Um, not quite exactly the same. Um, there are um, there, there are a number of different exercises and um, there are some modeling programs that attempt to do that. Um, they are used, um, although not very widely to my knowledge. Okay, great. Um, and one last question comes from Judith, who notes that she spent several months in New Orleans um, during the recovery from Katrina. And it was clear that the so-called Cajun Navy was critical to saving lives in the response phase. She asks, have you observed any movement to make room for these unaffiliated first responders? And I'll add on to that, especially in light of what you just said about volunteer fatigue. 
Yeah, um, actually there has. So uh, there was a group in Texas during Harvey called uh, Crowdsource Rescue. Um, they were an emergent group like the Cajun Navy, right, where if people aren't familiar, just uh, people from across Louisiana and Texas kind of jumped in their boats and just went to start rescuing people during Katrina. Kind of a similar situation unfolded during Harvey uh, in Houston. Uh, Crowdsource Rescue, um, has uh, since Harvey expanded into a more formal organization and their leadership has um, undertaken significant efforts to partner with first responder agencies and emergency management agencies uh, to kind of coordinate with them uh, rather as being kind of a completely separate informal uh, search and rescue group. Uh, and there are definitely, you know, I mentioned that there's often conflict between informal and formal groups. Um, there is definitely an increasing recognition in emergency management and among that formal system of the importance of having volunteer groups um, be involved and kind of the value of incorporating them in from the start. Um, and they are, um, <laughs> they, they are posting a lot about how they're preparing to still be able to do search and rescue in light of the pandemic. So that is a, a hopeful sign. Good. Well, a hopeful sign is a good place to end for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Samantha Montano, for sharing your um, expertise with us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. I hope that you'll come back tomorrow when we'll be talking about climate adaptation and, and what that looks like um, in a eventually post-COVID world. Um, and, uh, and that's it for today. So thanks again. We'll see you soon.